Welcome to my class, The Psychology of Fintech. Um, this is the third session of my first class. So, are you ready for AI and finance is the uh, topic of this session. All in all, all I'm trying to say is beware of, you know, those snake oil salespersons, right? What do you mean, snake oil salespersons? Well, fintech and all these kinds of sexy technologies, that's great. But every now and then, you will see a lot of um, overselling and hype and misleading in the name of technology. We have you know, non-engineering guys like Bunkwa guys, right? The literature guys or economics or business guys. We have some psychological uh, inferiority complex about uh, against these engineering engineers or math guys, right? So that whatever mathematics, whatever statistics, whatever quantitative sounds superior as if they are the truth of lives. I want to warn you against this kind of mistakes and this overselling of, uh, how do you say, uh, snake oil sales takes place even in fintech world. So let's go. Now, only if they could have said no is the, uh, you know, the title of this slide that I wanted to say. The case of AI team in Shinan Bank, one of the biggest banks in Korea, uh, banking group. They, uh, they established an uh, AI team and span it off as a subsidiary, as a way to pioneer fintech. It's like AlphaGo of finance. If you don't remember what AlphaGo was, it was the uh, AI machine by Google DeepMind to beat uh, the Go player Isedol like five years ago or six years ago. It was a big shock. Now AI, it's the area, it's the age of AI, right? With that, these, everything was, you know, trying to, every company was trying to attach this AI in their forehead. I, AI anything. I should have said AI Andy, AI and Kim Jong Han kind of things. You always feel like, oh, so sexy, man. No. Come on, um, Shin Han, right? What did they say? Um, they developed AlphaGo of finance. What? And then they said, with the launch of Shin Han AI in 2019, uh, Shin Han Financial Group became the first financial holding company in Korea to introduce a Korea uh, a company with specialized uh, artificial intelligence capabilities. Okay, we seek to explain its business through a variety of AI. Uh, we seek to expand its business through a variety of AI-powered investment consulting services. So this is their CEOs. Okay, a lot of mathematical formulas or works seem to be going on, or they are just I don't know, on the blackboard. And let's see. Our they, he said our AI found out that the inflation rate of Zimbabwe has a significant predictive power about S&P 500 index return. Oh my God! We don't know why, but that's what AI is about. You get an unexpected predictor from nowhere. It's completely out of the conventional economic theory or human knowledge. I, uh... Of course, psychology is not in economics, so it's out of economic theory. But is this the same as the psychology that I talk about in our class? I want you to be aware and watch out, okay, for that kind of mistakes, right? Typical response of finance majors uh, to this kind of wordings when they say, wow, so sexy. I must learn AI. Yeah, master AI, whatever. And then, what, what do I say? Uh, snake oil salesman. There are too many of them, okay? Um, in fact, why do we have so, ma so many uh, bubbles and crashes in human history, human financial history? Because we've been having so many snake oil salesmen in the name of science, in the name of mathematics, in the name of technologies. 
Aren't we suffering another crash because of that? Right now, in 2022, in the middle of it, right? It's repeating. People make mistakes repeatedly. But what am I trying to say over here in Shinan AI? Here is what happened in Zimbabwe inflation. Okay, Zimbabwe's inflation rate was at that 10% rate around. And then all of a sudden in 2007 and 9 and 8, right? 8, it got out of control. We call it hyperinflation. Okay. Um, then afterwards, what did they do? They deserted their own currency and then they dollarized their currency. US dollar, they adopted it. So the inflation rate plunged down to like about 1% or something afterwards. Now, what were they trying to do? Shinan AI. Okay. Shinan AI. Well, um, if you look at this whiteboard, here's what must have happened. We can pretty much guess what it is. Right? Here is the explanatory variable, Zimbabwe's inflation rate. Okay? And then here, let's say S&P 500 index return the next year. Okay? X, X and Y like this. Okay? This must be the plot they would have done. The thing is, usually they are not correlated with each other. So historical day, data, uh, uh, Zimbabwe's interest rate in T minus one, one year before and then current year T, right? Then last year, Zimbabwe inflation rate, whatever that must have been, who cares? S&P 500 is not related. So that their data points will be like this, right? Everywhere. But in 2008, T minus one, 2008, they had such a hyperinflation somewhere here. And then it coincided with the next year's S&P 500 going into like 35% or something. Because that was right after the recovery from financial crisis, right? Lehman Brothers global financial crisis. Outliers, yes. If you run a regression with these outliers, what would you have? Well, because of this huge influence of one single observation, the regression line will be positive and significant. And you say you will you will say that, oh, we found out a statistically significant correlation between these Zimbabwe's inflation and the US stock market return in the next year. Wow! AI power number one sexy. Oh, yeah. It's the statistics basics that you have to remove this guy away. I mean, right? They didn't do it. And they sold it in the newspaper. Why? To attract new clients, new customers. It's attention drawing so that the retail customers may feel, oh, that's so, Shinan is so advanced. So we had to go to that branch and then put my money as a deposit. Shinan is great. Marketing. I said marketing. Life is about marketing. Sales. Life is about sales. But this is not what I'm talking about, right? This is like bluffing, right? Um, misleading those, uh, you know, and even unethical. Come on. Why unethical? Because, because this Shinhan AI group, one of my friends, one of my friends visited Shinhan AI one time and then he found out and he talked to the guys in the group. And then he realized that the Shinan AIs, right? That company has, uh, you know, uh, they advertised and they say they are very proud to have the computer science guys, a PhD, computer science PhDs, and then the math PhDs and statistics PhDs as a core members of this group. So they are the boss. And then the economics majors, their master's degree guys or business degree undergraduate guys are supporting them as a subordinates. Okay? 
So these are the econ guys or business guys and then master's degree or undergraduate. These are PhD guys. Now the question is, do they talk to each other? Can they support? The communication matters. But they didn't seem to talk to each other that much. Why? Lack of understanding, right? And especially the guys with math training, they have this kind of, I don't know, superiority complex. You don't understand what I'm doing. And then these guys in Korean culture, they don't dare to say no to their bosses. Even the guys with the PhD, oh, they must be having superior knowledge, so I should not challenge them. But removing outliers is something you could do it, even with undergraduate degrees, and say, hey, boss, you're making stupid mistake. Come on! Before this kind of Zimbabwe thing go into the mass media, they should have checked it and then blocked them. They didn't. Culturally, this is a huge problem. And if you believe Shinhan is the only company that suffers this kind of cultural issues, lack of communications, authoritarian rulings, wake up, man. Uh, you know, they have to, they need much more check and balances within their organization. So, I said, are you ready for AI and finance? To get ready, what do you need? The check and balance within this organization. Communication within this organization. Okay? Uh, isn't it all about the numbers and technology? Superiority? No. No, 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 no. It's all about your communication. All right? So in that sense, in our class, I'm going to encourage you to talk to each other much more. Um, group discussions and things like that, right? So make it your habit to talk to each other instead of zipping your mouth at it. Technology must be great. No. Um, a lot of snake oil salesmen can appear through that culture. Uh, yeah, right. And... Bare necessities for data science. That means you guys, what do you need? Number uh, three things you need. Solid understanding in statistics. Removing those outliers, right? And programming skills. Python, R, or whatever. SAS, or Hadoop. Number three, domain knowledge. Your specialty area. Okay? Economics. By the way, Zimbabwe, should it be controlling or affecting the U.S. economy? Hell no. That causality relation, right, um, should come from your domain knowledge. If you have solid understanding of economics, then you would be able to have said, you know, Zimbabwe is not going to affect the U.S. economy. So that does not, not make sense, right? Um, don't let it go into that pure data mining. You need a solid backup by the economic theory or behavioral psychological theory in that sense, right? So solid understanding and statistics and programming skills and domain knowledge, you need those things as a uh, successful data scientist. And number four, if I added one more, that is check and balance within your organization. But that is not about the data scientist per se yourselves, but about your company as a whole, okay, to get ready for this AI. Um, yeah, right. So that's the story that I tell you over here. Only if they could have said no to their bosses. Right. Yeah. Age discrimination in Korea. Oh, older guys and younger guys, they don't talk to each other. Especially the younger guys are too much like uh, uh, obedient. You have to get rid of that culture. And seniority based rigid culture, rigidity. Oh my God. So that's something we have to be bear in mind, right? The next thing is about um, conventional banks and then the fintech companies, right? Um, number 65, what does it mean? Well, that's J.B. Diamond, J.P. Morgan CEO's age in 2021. 
Well, at the same time, coincidentally, that turns out to be the number of pages uh, of the letter of shareholders J uh, Jamie Dimon wrote uh, in that fiscal year, preceding fiscal year, right? Have you ever written any letter to your girlfriend or boyfriend, um, 65 pages long letter, right? <laughs> it's a torturing letter, right? It's not even a love letter, come on. I, uh, um, if you look at the letter to shareholders by Warren Buffett, it's typically 14 pages or 15 pages long. But why should it have been more than four times long? Oh my God. Um, Jamie Dimon had a lot to say. In essence, in that letter, he was complaining. It's so unfair. There's just nothing we can do. That's a key message that I can get from his uh, uh, letter. What? What's so unfair? Okay. Because he was comparing his own traditional bank against fintech companies. And then the fintech companies are eating up their businesses. Ah, I don't like that. The thing is, the thing is, um, he set up a table like this, uh, comparing 11 points of comparison. Um, in a sense, uh, in, in essence, in essence, he was saying that the banks are highly regulated and their hands are tied. They cannot do anything, okay, uh, no matter what, in terms of the banking competition. Why? Because after 2008 global financial crisis, the financial supervisories got in and then tried to intervene a lot of their businesses to make sure that the banks are doing safer business. Make sure that the banks are not taking excessive risk in their investment banking division or in their prop trading desk. They cannot do sexy financial products okay like derivatives or whatever they cannot develop uh, you know uh, complicated products and then they have to report more intensively to the regulatory agents every quarter much more frequently and then a lot more in detail and that they have to make sure that they know about their clients KYC know your customers right the trading partners, do you know who you are trading with? And then you have to make sure that you know about the uh, customers that you trade with and then report it to the regulators very frequently. And that drives up the whole, how do you say, uh, consumes a lot of their resources. So they could not do as much business on you. Whereas in fintech, um, they are not regulated essentially. Um, lower capital requirements compared to the banks, and no operational risk uh, capital, no liquidity requirements, no FDIC insurance. Uh, FDIC stands for Federal Depository uh, Insu uh, Insurance Corporation. So when the bank uh, is about to go bankrupt, then the insurance companies will pay for you to the de depositors so that there would not be a bank run. So that's the FDIC's idea. So for that FDIC, the banks have to pay the insurance fees, but fintech companies, they don't. No obligation. And then no levy of surcharges, no costly regulations or fewer privacy restrictions. And then just, they are on their own. Whatever they want to do, they can do it on their own. Is it fair? Is their concern? Okay. Uh, so that was his complaint. Um, and he also praises the big tech firms in their fintech competition. He says, oh, fintech companies, that you guys are doing good. Uh, the services are intuitive. I told you before about the Kakao Bank, right? Intuitive apps and simple and fast services. Venmo me or whatever, right? Betterment, right? Using social media data and then combining fast, uh, with, com uh, combine, uh, combing uh, fast with other platform services, uh, combining, right, combining fast with other platform services. So they are fast and nimble. That's great. But they need to be regulated more. Otherwise, it's unfair. And um, what is it? There is a reason why those banks are regulated. We call it 
raison d'être, which is like the reason for being there. The regu- highly intensive regulation. Why do banks get regulated? Because they deserve it. And fintech companies, given that they are financial institution, institutions, they also deserve it. And soon, he says, you guys will be regulated too. Okay? Um, he is essentially saying, welcome to the world of financial supervision. Right? Welcome to the underworld. Once you come in over here, the growth prospects that you enjoy right now will be gone. Right? <clears throat> That's what he said. You guys touched, you guys opened the Pandora's box. The taxation problem in digital products and services will be huge. Information security for personal data will be a serious issue. And an antitrust, anti money uh, monopoly regulation will be huge for you guys. So, unfair treatment of the apps of their own if they are launched on their platform. So uh, these kind of concerns will bother you, he said. Okay. Um, yeah. And then he was convincing that they, uh, conventional banks, JP Morgan, was trying their, uh, trying hard to you know protect their banks safely, uh, preparing for cyber attack risk and things like that. And then the, you know. Given that the fintech companies or uh, cryptocurrency exchanges were attacked by those hackers, we are doing rather safer. So please come to us. That was that's what he said. And then the COVID nineteen, um, he was saying something about it. But in the end, he was saying that you guys, the country wise, or the central bankers, could have endured uh, and then overcome the COVID nineteen crisis with this, uh, uh, you know. Um, printing a lot of money is because uh, the banking systems like us we were prepared much better than before so you know you have to praise us come on pat our shoulders and that was his message and then lo and behold uh, we are doing less risky business these days okay so that's what he argued what did, what do you mean by this one out of deposit that you get as a uh, the commercial banks and retail banks you get re- uh, deposits right Hundred dollars, you get a deposit. Out of this, how much do you lend out to the uh, corporate borrowers or retail borrowers? Well, they used to lend out almost all of their deposit amounts uh, in 2000. Very risky situation. You need to reserve somehow. Nowadays, um, only 64 to 76 percent. Okay, the remaining part is key, kept in their vault, so they are doing safer business. That's what they argued. Okay, so that's what the traditional banks' uh, argument uh, argues, right? Um, tech fins, so many snake oil salesmen. I say also again, one one more time. What is this about? Well, um, tech fin, that jargon. Okay. Uh, is so hot in fashion so that you will face this kind of questions in your job interviews. Some employers will ask, what is the distinction between tech fin versus fintech? And if you don't distinguish these two, they will say like, oh, you don't even know the difference between these two. Um, But here is what I find, okay? Who is the original proposer of this word tech fin okay that's jack ma of alibaba um and then he said we alibaba a tech company and then we are launching alipay and financial this is a s- originating from it company and t- uh, going expanding into finance business so even if it is fintech company we are not simple fintech companies we are tech fin companies because we originate from that ayah uh fintech started from banking and they added a ict yeah 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 the thing is he is a how do you say um he used to be an english teacher in china he's good at language and marketing so buzzword he can create a lot of creative buzzwords attracting a lot of attention tech fin so sexy baby I, uh, the thing is okay um <clears throat> why did he propose this one 
Okay, why did he propose this side, uh, jargon in 2016? Because he had in mind that he wanted to do an IPO, initial public offering of Ant Financial in 2020. Four years down the road, he had a plan. Oh, you had a plan before. So what's the idea? In IPO, it's all about price to book ratio, PB or PE ratio. Okay, uh, how would you value? IPO is about what? Initial public offering. Before IPO, Ant Financial is private company, privately held, not traded in the stock market. Only small number of investors uh, hold the ownership of this company. But with the IPO, they open up their ownership to the general public, you and me. Okay, we could invest in these companies, uh, I, uh, the IPO companies, and become a shareholders. By that, they are raising capital, attracting a lot of money from the investors in the equity stock market. For that purpose, you need a higher valuation in the IPO market. How would you get a higher valuation? If your company gets high price to book ratio, okay, if uh, all the investors agree, many of the investors agree that you deserve high PB ratio, then your valuation in the uh, IPO market will be very, very high. For the ones who don't understand what the PB ratio is, I mean, I told you you need uh, understanding in financial uh, management, right? As a refresher, okay, PB ratio is this, PB, PBR. This is a uh, price per share in the market, market value. Okay, market value or market cap, market cap, market capitalization. 시총 in Korean terminology, 시총. And this one is book value of equity. Right? So your accounting uh, balance sheet, right? In the balance sheet, BS, it's not bullshit, but bull, balance sheet. Assets, liabilities, and equities that you have over here. Historical book value of equity, you must have it every end of the year. That's this guy. Okay? The denominator. And then the numerator is a market cap or market value of equity oh the value of equity isn't it the same as the equity over here partly you are right because it's all about the equity holders the owner of the company right equity holders value in the market over here over here is the equity holders value in the book historical record okay now the numerator is about market value which is, it tells us about how much the market investors assess or perceive your, the company's value is, the equity value is today. Today's market cap. Today in the market. Okay. Real time, it changes. Denominator is what already happened in history. So it tells us about for each dollar of equity investors invested in that company, how much is it perceived in the market? Market investors. For $1, you want this to be evaluated as better than $1 in the market. Otherwise, the equity holders will feel very unhappy. Okay? So the ratio of PB ratio, you want it to be greater than one hopefully but that's only in your wildest dreams if you look at the pb ratio of Wuri bank our glorified uh, korean conventional bank the pb ratio of Wuri bank is 0.5 aya for each dollar that equity investors invested only half of it is you know uh assessed in valued in the market okay why did i invest it was a waste of money right 
So point five is conventional bank. Regret. Okay. Whereas ICT companies like, I don't know, Neighbor Kakao, right? Or Google, their PB ratio must be like what? 10 times to 15 times sometimes if it is in a bubble. Okay. 10. For each dollar of investment in equity, it is perceived as $10 in the market. Wow! If you were historical equity investors, this is your jackpot company, right? Um, that's a, you know, growth stocks company, growth stocks. Why is, does this thing happen 10 times versus 0.5 times? Largely because of the growth prospect. If the company has, is, has, you know, it has big growth potential in the future, okay, then investors can expect a lot of good cash flow, big cash flows from the companies. And that's that what's going to be driving this price to be very, 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 very high compared to the same amount of uh, equities that you got. Okay. Now, coming back to this Alipay, Alipay, Jack Ma, in 2020, they wanted to go to the IPO. And then in IPO market, you want to get a PB ratio assessment from the investors. So the investors, uh, investment banking, uh, they will come up with the legitimate PB ratio this Alipay deserves. What PB ratio do you want these companies to have? 0 0.5 or 10 times? Obviously, this one, 10 times higher. The higher PB ratio that you get from the IP uh, investment bankers, then you can claim more in the equity market and the equity investors will put a lot more money to you compared to this one, 0.5, right? So you want to get perceived as a tech company instead of finance company. Finance company, no growth potential. JP Morgan, I told you. Oh, life is unfair. We are here. Whereas tech fin, uh, this is fintech guys. You're there. The growth potential. You can do whatever you want. We cannot do whatever we want because of the intensive regulation. We want to get free from that regulation, please. Otherwise, you get down to here. That's the argument back and forth. And Jack Ma said, "What? We are tech fins instead of fintech. Don't call us fintech. We are tech fins." Now we see why he is claiming that, right? He wanted to get this better valuation in their IPO, okay? And he insulted those uh, financial regulators of the uh, China, okay? And then what happened? Right before the IPO, he was summoned, the Jack Ma was summoned by the central bankers or financial supervisors, right? And then he basically disappeared from the public sight, right? Ah, yeah. And then the IPO was canceled three days before, or was it five days before, right? Early November 2020, uh, was it 21? Yeah, and it was just canceled, gone. So now we see TechFin versus FinTech argument, right? Do we need to really distinguish these two? Or is it because of a marketing strategy to get better valuation by Ant Financial or Jack Ma? Okay, that's the thing. Of course, your employers will ask this question without knowing this kind of things. But you have to educate them, be ready to argue with them, right? <laughs> um, so that's that. And this is a chart by of Kakao Bank. The, the Korean fintech companies, what was their valuation like? Their PB ratio was not 10 times that they used to claim, but 3.67 times like uh, four, four or five months ago. Now it is even worse, getting closer to what? Conventional banks. Jamie Dimon said it. Welcome to the regulation world, right? You get hit by the regulation together with us and let's see what happens to you. That's what's happening right now. 
very interesting development and uh, in many ways it is a very interesting development that we have to look at and study it um so i hope you enjoyed it and uh next uh, class uh i'm going to talk about more about the um psychology of fintech about the origination uh, what is that the uh, the how do you say um ancient form of fintech that happened to be in Sing uh, in korea okay what is that about wait and see okay i hope to see you later all right bye bye